This talk will focus on the indications for performing total shoulder replacement, i.e. a replacement in which both sides of the joint are replaced, in patients with arthritis whose symptoms are not controlled with simple non-operative management strategies. My name is Gavin Jennings and I'm a specialist shoulder surgeon practicing at the Royal United Hospital and the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Diseases in Bath, UK. This talk was originally presented at the 9th International Clinical Anatomy course at Padua University, Italy. The pathologies for which total shoulder replacement may be indicated include primary osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis secondary to conditions such as infection or trauma, inflammatory arthritis, avascular necrosis, but certainly not for cuff tower arthropathy or proximal humeral fracture. There are certain prerequisites required before a total shoulder replacement can be performed. These include the ability to gain access to and expose the glenoid, the presence of adequate glenoid bone stock to be able to support the implanted socket, and an intact rotator cuff. The rotator cuff must be intact as if it subsequently fails to function, the mechanics of the shoulder are changed, resulting in early loosening of the glenoid component of the replacement, the so-called rocking horse effect. This is why total shoulder replacements are not suitable in the management of rotator cuff arthropathy or indeed proximal humeral fractures where there is a high risk of the tuberosities failing to heal to the prosthesis, leaving the shoulder cuff deficient. If these requirements are not met, a hemiarthroplasty or reverse total shoulder replacement may be the preferred option. Possible alternatives to shoulder replacement include debridement, biological resurfacing, arthrodesis, and suprascapular nerve block. Arthroscopic debridement has been shown to be effective in 80% of patients, but is less reliable if the joint is incongruent or there are large osteophytes present. A more recent study has confirmed its efficacy, but again not in patients with large osteophytes, grade 4 disease involving both the humerus and glenoid, or if the remaining joint space is less than two millimeters. Biological resurfacing of the native arthritic glenoid has had some success. Many types of graft have been used for the interposition, including those made from decellularized human skin, such as the graft jacket. Cells are removed, maintaining the structure of the extracellular matrix, with the aim of providing a scaffold for the ingrowth of host cells. The beer reported reasonable midterm results of using an arthroscopic interposition of the graft in younger arthritic shoulders. Interposition grafts have also been performed along with hemiarthroplasty, with promising early results, but its efficacy has not been borne out in the longer term. Arthrodesis or fusion of the joint still has a place in selected patients with arthritis. For example, if there's paralysis, instability, after failed replacement surgery, tumour resection, or traumatic malunion, or infection. Rumen series show good results of arthrodesis, but with a high complication rate. An example of an arthrodesis is shown here. A reconstruction plate and screws were used to achieve fusion of the humerus, both with the acromion and glenoid. Suprascapular nerve blockade can be used to relieve pain in an arthritic shoulder. In our unit, we perform this initially with local anaesthetic and steroid, and if successful, an ablation may be subsequently performed. There's a relative paucity of evidence in the literature on the long-term results of ablation, however. When performing total shoulder replacement, there's long been debate over whether replacing the humeral side alone i.e. a hemiarthroplasty, is likely to have as good an outcome as performing a total shoulder replacement. The modern literature is now overwhelmingly in favour of performing a total shoulder replacement if the prerequisites described previously have been met. There is evidence that a total shoulder replacement will perform better than a hemiarthroplasty even if the rotator cuff is torn as long as the tear could be repaired at the time of the replacement. In terms of the ability to get to the glenoid, 
there should be little difficulty for the experienced surgeon. This slide shows the good access achievable even when the humeral head is in titchy, such as when performing a resurfacing total shoulder replacement. Historically, there have been concerns over performing total shoulder replacement in patients with an inflammatory arthritis. This study from the Mayo Clinic shows that as long as the cuff is intact, this patient group does better with the total shoulder replacement. Rosing had previously shown that the results of total shoulder replacement in rheumatoid patients were as good in patients who had had a cuff repair as in those in which the cuff was intact at the time of surgery. The majority of outcome data refers to stem total shoulder replacement, but the evidence is emerging of the good outcomes achievable with stemless replacements. Mariotti showed in 2017 that the outcomes in the short term were as good with stemless as stemmed prostheses. In the last seven years, there have been a number of short-term and medium-term studies drawing the same conclusion. In summary, the literature supports the use of total shoulder replacement in preference to hemiarthroplasty, even in the presence of a repairable cuff tear, even in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. In other words, if a total shoulder can be reliably done, do it. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to contact me for any further information.